getting started. Um, okay, so let me tell you a little bit about, I don't know if I know anyone on this call, but uh, I'm going to pretend I do, that you're all um, all around the country. Nod your head yes. Yes. All right. How many people here um, have been to a baseball game? Raise your hand. <laughs> all right, good. So we're all, we have something in common. Okay. So first of all, I hope you're all well, no matter where you are and you're healthy. I'm Jeremy Fine. I'm a rabbi in St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, I do a lot of funky things as a rabbi, I think, outside the norm. Um, and that's mainly because I find Talmud to be very boring. That's not true. I <laughs> um, that's not true. So I teach Talmud too. So, um, so I'll give you a little background. So basically, um, I was getting married uh, while I was in rabbinical school the summer before I left to go on my year in Israel. It was my, what turned out to be my second year in Israel, but, but to go with my wife. And um, we, uh, and I had nothing to do. Uh, I, I mean, I had a, I had sort of a, um, I had a, um, an in, like I, I was shadowing a rabbi in, in Highland Park, Illinois. I was working actually for the Schechter Network. I, I was really not so interested in the pulpit, more interested in day school education. And so I, um, I was, uh, really had some sort of like, a lot of time on uh, my hand and my and I just started this like random blog and about Jews and sports and uh, I'm hearing a lot of feedback from someone so um, I gotta ask you as this happens though do you hear that Could I please suggest that everybody mute themselves all right great so um and then uh, basically, so I started this website, and um, and the website um, said, um, and, and basically, yeah, it was fine. Things, and then I was in Israel one night, and I woke up, and I had like ten to twelve thousand uh, reads in one night. I said to my wife, I said, I don't know what happened. Like my my website just blew up. What could possibly have happened? And it turns out that it was Julian Edelman's breakout party, for those of you who are Patriot fans or, or um, Tom Brady fans. And Julian Edelman had this big night. And everyone who, who ever basically Googled, is Julian Edelman Jewish, found my website. And I was off and running. And I, monet I was able to monetize it a little bit. And I was able to get some bigger interviews because of it. And it slowly morphed into basically now I literally can go somewhere and people like someone today even emailed me and said, I can't believe I was on a meeting with you with the great Rabino. I sent that to all of, I sent your link to all of my friends. And I said, I appreciate it. I, I hope to one day be known for more than just a guy who likes sports. So, um, so, so the, the, it, it's, and it blossomed, then it turned into a company when I was the assistant rabbi, for those of you who are um, all congregations with assistant rabbis, let me tell you something. Uh, the assistant rabbi is the easiest job in the history of the world. The senior rabbi is arguably the hardest job in the history of the world. So uh, when I was the assistant rabbi, I uh, had much more time on my hands. And um, I turned it into a company. And uh, I started booking. And I still do this a little bit on the side of if any of your synagogues are interested, either virtually or God willing soon in person, booking Jewish athletes at different synagogues, events, uh, youth groups, nonprofits. And we did fairly well in our first year. And then I was promoted to senior rabbi um, relatively quickly and uh, no longer was able to do this. I occasionally like uh, will someone will, if I think it's a very easy thing, I'll, I'll help the synagogue do it. So I'm doing one for USY and two, I have three actually bookings next week. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of the story of the blog. Uh, it turned into a company, turned back into a sort of a blog that I don't do every day. I do usually a story a week or an interview. That's what I'm most interested in, in meeting people. It's probably why I became a rabbi. And, um, and today um, it served, it's allowed me to do some really great things. Um, I got to cover the Final Four. I got to cover the Super Bowl. 
Um, literally, as the confetti was falling down on the team, I was on the floor at the Final Four when it was in Minnesota two years ago. At, um, or as we, as we like to call it in the biz, the last Final Four, since there was no, no Final Four this year. And then, um, and then this year, right before COVID hit, I was actually at the Super Bowl. I covered it for uh, a day and a half, um, and that was really, really, really fun. And got to do some interviews and take some pictures. And, uh, I, and, and you know, the, I'm, nod your heads yes if you've heard the, the phrase, fake it till you make it. So that's basically what I do. I, 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 just to, as a quick note, so I showed up at the Final Four um, in a suit and tie exactly at 8 a.m. And I walk into the press room and I am all alone. And there's no one there when it opens. And I wait and um, there, <laughs> no one's dressed nice except for me and Andy Katz, who for those of you who watch the Final Four coverage, he's sort of the lead guy. So I said to Andy, teach me. <laughs> and he did. So Andy and I have kept in touch. Um, he lives in the Connecticut area and really great guy. And um, that's sort of the blog. And um, what, I, what I would say for it for all of you, and one of the, one of the things, uh, a lot of it couldn't happen if my synagogue didn't support me. And um, that is to say that it's, I think it's relatively um, important that we um, – allow our rabbis to be more than just people who show up to Minyan. Um, I say that a lot. Um, not only because in the mornings, you know, let's say there's morning Minyan. Well, if I go to morning Minyan at 630 and now I'm tired the rest of the day, um, which you would be, um, you sort of deplete your energy. Um, and uh, it's hard to focus on things that sort of broaden or if they teach all day, every day. Um, now, some rabbis want to do that. Maybe that is their, their function and that's great. But, but if the rabbi is resistant to that, um, understand that like I spend, I'm at 7 o'clock, 7.30, maybe 8 o'clock with a congregate meeting um, and beginning business because they go, everyone, go, I'm assuming lots of you go to work. Um, and then allowing me to follow my passions as well has helped the synagogue with resources, um, different different connections, um, expand sort of our our reach and our global sort of understanding of what we can be as a synagogue, as opposed to you know just coming to Minyan in the morning, um, which also is important, but not 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 the only thing rabbis I think in today's world do. So that has been key that the support of the synagogue has been able for me to do that. Um, I think I'm gonna get, I, I was told to tell a few stories. So I'll tell four quick stories. Two are mine and two are from the athletes I've met. So I am imagining, since this is a group of men's club, that there are a handful of Yankee fans here, correct? No Yankee fans? Dave is nodding his head no. Harvey's saying yes. Okay. Well, I, my guess, okay, I'm, I'm guessing there's a few. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Ron Bloomberg, uh, the first designated hitter in the history of baseball, Ron's a great guy. If your synagogue's ever looking for someone just to schmooze all day long, <laughs> all year long, Ron is uh, the best at schmoozing. So Ron was one of the first athletes we brought into the synagogue. We usually bring one, maybe two a year, depending on what we're doing. And Ron came in and told a story, which I'll tell, um, that, uh, you know, he sh so they drafted him, this, this Jewish kid from the middle of Atlanta, um, is drafted by the New York Yankees, number one. Ron is still the only Jewish player drafted number one in Major League Baseball. Alex Bregman was a, the number two pick just a couple of years ago. So Ron, they, they fly him out to New York. He signs the first million-dollar contract. They take him to a steakhouse and seat him next to Frank Sinatra. And then he heads to spring training where he's roomed next to Mickey Mantle. This is a, a little, my, he's drafted out of high school, mind you. So, so here's this little 18 year old kid who's never left Atlanta and is now in New York City with Frank Sinatra and Mickey Mantle. So he puts his stuff down, he's a nice Jewish boy and uh, Mantle unpacks his stuff. And basically he never, Mantle never came back to his room the entire spring training. He slept out every single 
uh, night. Oh, it says Ron Bloomberg had a Zoom presentation two weeks ago. Oh, that's great. So Ron's great. So I th always thought it was a funny story that Ron's, Ron's experience, and uh, for those, did he tell that story? No, okay, so, so that's a little bit of um, sort of just Jewish ba inside, insider baseball. Um, next, uh, one of the pleasures of my blog and sort of being involved is I'm, what, I'm sort of the Team Israel rabbi, uh, Team Israel baseball rabbi. Um, and that's not an official title, although I will make it so soon. Um, I've written mo most of the Aliyah letters um, for the players who have been going over there. And um, in doing so, I've gotten to know the players and I ran a big fundraiser for them a few weeks ago where um, they, uh, we had about 15 major leaguers, Sean Green, Kevin Pilar, um, who else was on? Danny Valencia. And we did a f baseball fantasy draft. We all the, any Jewish player in history was eligible and we formed a team. We had a bunch of MLB writers to decide who would uh, win the game. And it was a lot of fun. And uh, so as a gift, Team Israel uh, was also auctioning off their jerseys. They said I could pick one for free. So I look at the list, and it's Jock Peterson, some of the guys that are playing today, um, and some of the my, you know players who are on Team Israel Baseball and their magical run and soon-to-be Olympic run. And uh, on the team was Mike Moustakis. Are there any uh, current Reds or Royals fans here? All right, so Mike Moustakis is a pretty good player. Uh, and definitely not Jewish. Oh, look, Mark Klee. Look at that. I didn't even see that. There we go. You didn't tell me the heavy hitters would be here. So, um, so Mike Moustakis is um, Mike Moustakis married a Jewish woman and was has the right of return to make Aliyah. So I said, oh my God, no one knows that Mike Moustakis. Why didn't he play? Apparently, he got injured the summer before the WBC, and you know, had we had Mike Moustakis in the middle of our lineup, there's a chance we could have even done even more because you're talking about a real major league bat. So that was, uh, that was something, uh, uh, a great story. So now I'm the only one with in, in the history of the world with the Mike Moustakis uh, jersey hanging on my wall. If we were in my basement, which I don't get good lighting in, I would show you my collection of Jewish sports memorabilia with about 30 baseballs and basketballs and toys. And I have every rookie card of every player ever in any sport, except for Erskine Meyer, 1915. Uh, it's not an easy card to come by and goes for hundreds of hundreds of dollars. Um, all right, let's see what other, I wrote one more door. And then, okay, so I'll tell you one other story, um, which is um, what we call Temple of Wrestling. Anyone, did anyone Google me before this? Okay, a few of you. Uh, raise your hand if you Googled me and the first thing that came up was wrestling. <laughs> okay, so I see a guy named Dave is doing that. So um, a few congregants approached, so I'm a huge professional wrestling fan. It is my, it is my guilty pleasure. Um, it is my escape from the rabbinate to forget that there are any serious problems I watch these men and women fake wrestle on. Uh, so when I had some congregants, so we've been looking at how do we use the synagogue building um, when it's empty? So let's say there's not Hebrew school, but for the most part on a Wednesday night, okay? The building is empty. Even if we have minion, it's quiet, you know, 10 people, 12, 15, 20 people show up. They're not making much noise. So a few congregants approached me. They said, we should really do something called Temple Mania. And I said, if you want to do this, I, I'm, I'm interested in seeing where this goes. So, um, uh, so anyways, the congregant who wanted to do it just basically let it drop. And I said, well, you got me started. I'm excited. And Mark can tell you when I'm excited about something, it happens. It's just going to happen. So, uh, except for Aliyah, my wife has nixed that. So that's the only, that's impenetrable. So um, the, the, so we started working with a company. It didn't work out. We went to the number one uh, wrestling promoter in Minnesota and we've put on a, two wrestling shows, which on a Wednesday night pack our synagogue with noise that is so exciting and I mean, 
it's exactly sort of the the excitement uh, that you would want in a building. Ruach, people are singing all sorts of Jewish songs. We have several Jewish wrestlers. We have a lot of non-Jewish wrestlers as well. We have storylines and Jewish sort of references built in. And uh, we've done two, two, twice it's been, the other two shows have been canceled because of COVID. Um, not only did we fill the synagogue on a Wednesday, random Wednesday night, we made money. And it became also this incredible interfaith program. So for those of you who are part of like your interfaith or social justice groups at your synagogues, I imagine they look very similar to my synagogues, which are the same people. And it's very, very hard to get new people to come to this. Um, and this is a struggle we have with our social ju justice committee. We ask them to do more action because that brings more people. Justice is, is a very niche people who want to sit there and just discuss. Uh, we're having this conversation right now with the social justice committee that really, really wants to um, talk about white privilege. And I said, for a lot of people, that's going to be a big, that's a, that's a word in a synagogue that might turn some people off. So, um, so we, we go down this road where I'm following Twitter. I think someone, one of you emailed me on Twitter. I, I'm rarely on Twitter, by the way. I, I tweet like the 30 seconds that I'm on, but the, 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 um, the, the tweet, the, the tweets come in the first rabbi I've ever met the first time in a synagogue. I didn't know. So-and-so was Jewish. The rabbi was so kind and welcoming to the community. And I realized, and the, and the wrestlers forget about it. Never, certainly never met a rabbi, but they probably never, most of them never met a Jew. And I realized we took 400 people who had never had no intention of an interfaith program and that's what it became because how many people just real like met a Jew for the first time and they're like wow they're not so different than me right which is something we very much struggle with in today's world and so at first we saw some pushback but after everyone poked their head in and saw the kind of enthusiasm the kids having the time of their life um, we had one uh, young boy come up to his father who's a friend of mine not a member of our show, but they sponsor every wrestling show because they think it's the best idea. And he, the boy runs up to dad and says, dad, can we get season tickets to Temple of Wrestling? <laughs> As if we run these every week, you know, like it's a, an NBA game. So those are just some of the stories of sort of the, 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 the Jewish sports world I created. There's, there's a handful of us um, who sort of play in this field where – um, we um, have, uh, you know, whether it's a website or we're involved in a Jewish sports team, uh, we're very much, all, a lot of us are connected and we talk relatively frequently and um, try to support each other. It's a very small niche community. And if anyone's interested in getting involved in something like that, I'm, I'm happy to try to point you in the right direction. Um, my hope was to take questions because I think that's, that's best. I'm happy to answer questions about some of the transformation of our synagogue, how we view sports. I'm happy to answer any sports questions people have. Um, I'm happy to debate sports, however you guys want to feel. I don't know, uh, am I handing it over to Elliot or to David? Again, I deeply apologize for being late. That is never, that never happens to me. And I literally have it on my calendar for, an, uh, for right now. Literally, I be, should have been signing on right now. <laughs> All right, David, you want to? Take over. Sure. Thank you, Danny. All right. So, um, Rabbi, I really want to thank you for being on with us tonight, and I hope we get this mix up squared away. We're really happy to have you. Um, I am a gigantic Red Sox fan, um, off the charts, as everybody knows. So, I just want if you could what you think about. <laughs> yeah, really. Everybody knows that. So, um, just your thoughts about what you think is going to happen this season. Sure. Uh, Red Sox will not win the World Series. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Stan, neither will the Cubs, trust me. Um, I, there's one thing I, you know, there's one, my parents raised me two Cubs, things. The Cubs shirt is only because our convention's in Chicago. Oh. I, uh, Stan, that's still not an excuse. So, um, I got lots of shirts. I have, I've, I've been to about 27 major league stadiums, including Wrigley, several times. 
uh, and I have a mini bat from every stadium in my office except for Wrigley Field. Um, you know, my parents said two rules Wrigley growing up. <laughs> marry Jewish, never marry a Cub fan. Those were the two rules I grew up with. Um, and it's in my ketubah that my wife will be a Sox fan for life. Um, so the uh, I think they're going to play. I, I do. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the uh, wrestlers in a second. So I, I think they will finish a season. Um, I'm an optimist when it comes to COVID. Uh, not that like I'm optimistic about COVID. <laughs> I think it's horrible, and I've been I've been really strict with my family. We've been inside, but in terms of like, you know, there was a number produced today in Minnesota that, and we're obviously in a, a different shape than every state is very different. But uh, there was a number today that of the of the deaths and there's nothing to take make light of it, there have been 50, about 1,500 deaths in Minnesota, and 1,200 of those have been um, either in a living facility or, an old, or, an, or um, an old age home. So the major league players, for all the numbers that came out yesterday of, uh, for the Marlins, let's say, or all the major league players who had it before, not one of them has been in the hospital. Not one because they're in tip top shape, they're getting the best treatment, they're, they're, they're distanced immediately. Um, so I, I think the NBA will finish. I think Major League Baseball will finish. I think hockey will finish. I'm most skeptical about the NFL because I think they're the least responsible league. So um, if they were in a bubble, I would tell you the NFL, or in some sort of bubble, I mean, 19 players opted out today. Um, you also have um, players who are, you know, while they're in good cardio shape, they're obese. Um, that's not to make light of the situation. It's the truth. They're, they're 300 something pounds. So the Bears today, Eddie Goldman, you know, he's, he's three something. He, he's not comfortable. And I, I respect that. I think as long as we're allowed to, opt, people are allowed to opt out and not lose their spot. Um, you know, I think that then I think baseball will happen. Uh, I think there might be pauses. I think we might end up having uh, 30 games and then stopping for a bubble or cutting certain teams or something like that. Um, I don't know where they would play, um, but, you know, like a dome. Uh, I don't know that people want to play in Tampa, but uh, where are the other domes? Maybe Milwaukee? I don't know. All right, so um, Go yeah. So the other question I have is, who's the most fascinating baseball player you ever interviewed? Because I know you've interviewed a lot of players. Yeah, I've interviewed well over 100. You know, most fascinating player? Player. Hmm. You know, I think the most fascinating major league play so t player. Um you know, some of the more interesting people are are, are not just players. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm about to interview Rachel Luba. Uh, okay, so I'll tell you the most uh, the most interesting player is probably Michael Schwimmer. Michael Schwimmer pitched for the Phillies uh, very briefly and the Blue Jays. Um, he was only in the league for about five six years. Um. And but Michael started a company basically while he was rehabbing that is one of the top anal analytics now in baseball. And he retired early. He had offers to come to training camp and he retired so that he can start this company. So they do two things. Um, they, one, um, they have uh, top line analytics and n the number one determining factor of when your pitcher is going to need Tommy John surgery. And it's not the release. So he's fascinating. He, they did a whole spread on him in ESP in uh, uh, Sports Illustrated, so you, you can go look that up. The other is that he has started to buy minor league, minor league leaguers in the sense that he, his company will pay a minor leaguer, let's say like a, whatever their set, some sort of prorated, you know, $100,000. So for those of you who don't know, minor leaguers make like less than your youth directors. And I don't mean it as a knock on your youth directors. I mean that it's like – it's half of a starting salary at most synagogues, right? Um, he, so they make, you know, very little money. They, they sleep at uh, host homes, even AAA, like even guys who, who next year will be making $20 million a year, the year before they're sleeping on someone's bed or someone's couch. So 
he then pays them, like let's say $100,000, his company, but then he owns 10% of their major league salary. So it's, a, it's, it's gambling, it's a risk, but he just hit Fernando Tatis was his biggest client. And he mm -hmm. bought that contract when he was, a tr was in single A. Fernando Tatis was traded by the White Sox. He wasn't even supposed to be so great. And then he came up through the system and became awesome. And now is the short starting starts up for the Padres and, and projected to be one of the best players in baseball. So Tatis is going to have next, you know, his first contract's good. His next contract could be, could be a $300 million contract and his company owns 10% of that. Wow. So a he's question. a really fascinating story. David, I have a question. Sure. I have a Rab, sure. Rabbi, go for it. Thank you. So, Rabbi, you, your your knowledge of baseball and and in your talk, do you keep track of um, Jewish club owners and and uh, Jewish ex baseball executives historically, and, and um, what their paths are? I mean, you know, guys like Theo Epstein, obviously, and uh, and Red Sox uh, Chaim. Uh, Bloom, Bloom. I guess. Yeah, um, so I, I do some of that. I've interviewed Mark Shapiro, who is, um, who's been with the Blue Jays and the Indians. Um, and he was also very famous um, for, uh, for those of you who saw Moneyball with, uh, you know, about uh, Billy Bean and uh, with Brad Pitt, he goes to Cleveland to make a trade. And that's Mike, Sh Mark, Sh I mean, that's not him, but, but that's the, the person he's depicting in that, in that movie. So uh, do any of them talk to you about like anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism amongst the baseball yeah. uh, higher ups or in the so, game generally? Yeah, I don't think there's much of it organizationally. I have never heard that, not in today's sports world. Um, what I have, obviously, some of the players of, you know, from the, you know, the Sandy Kopecks and the Hank Greenbergs and those. Um, and I think there's more of it in the NFL. Uh, Julian Edelman went on record a few weeks ago and said he's been called a kike on the field. Yeah. So that still exists. But I've never heard it from, you know, Marge Schott was an enormous racist. Uh, I imagine <coughs> I imagine as a Jew it wasn't so great working for her either. But I've never really heard that. You know, it's interesting. Some of these owners are in all the sports are very active Jewishly and some are not. Jerry Reinsdorf, who owns the Bulls and the White Sox, is not. Mark Cuban is not. Um, uh, the, um, but, you know, um, maybe his name shouldn't be totally always excitement, but like Sheldon Abelson is, is uh, very involved uh, uh, in, in this kind of stuff. Robert Kraft, obviously, is the biggest name. Robert Kraft is a huge Jewish philanthropist and one of the least, I mean, um, we don't have to talk about his private life, but in his public philanthrop philanthropic life, he has been uh, as big of a mensch as you can be for Israel, for Yeshiva University. Um, I've, I've had a conversation with him uh, and found him to be the kindest, gentlest man um, in my experience, my small experience with him. Um, and so, um, yeah, my experience is that in the front office, in coaching world, none of that is ha none of that takes place. That you know, we do have a long way. It's clear from the last few weeks in the NBA and in the NFL, um, we have a long way in educating um, those sports on Jews, and that's uh, that's placed on the shoulders of plenty of their of the players, the Jud Julian Edelman, the Mitchell Schwartzes the Team Israel guys who've come back. You know, Ryan LaVarnway has been great at this, uh, who, who hopefully will get called up from the Marlins now that everyone's sick. Well, well the, the NBA has a tremendous history of, of Jewish players in the beginning and, and club owners, and they organize. Yeah, at the beginning. Obviously, that, it, that does not hold true it's, it, uh, for long term. It, I would say it's a sport we've, we, besides golf, that we've had the least amount of success in. Um, uh, we do have an Israeli who will be a top five, top 10 pick this year, and uh, he'll be incredible. Um, and obviously, Israeli basketball is far more the story than Jewish basketball today. Um, but yes, obviously, the first point ever in the NBA was scored by a Jew. 
uh, I'm not sure we've had many points after that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, Omri Kasu is a good player. He played for 10 years. Gal Meckel didn't really make it. Um, today you have TJ Leaf, who's not Jewish, but he's Israeli. I got to interview him last year at the Timberwolves game. Uh, that was my first time in an NBA locker room. Um, it's, I, I, I'm six foot three, 230 something pounds. I, I, it's the only place I feel small is an NBA locker room. I'm, I'm teeny. TJ Leaf is 6'11", Doug McDermott 6'10". I was like, I'm like, well, you know, I didn't even know what to do. I felt like all of you when you look at me. <laughs> um, I do want to, someone asked a question to me privately in the, in the text box and said, uh, who is your favorite Jewish wrestler? Uh, they also said the Cubs look good so far. So Neil, I'm going to ignore that part. But uh, who is your favorite Jewish wrestler? Um, so, you know, I'm partial to the macho man, Randy Savage, who uh. I grew up watching, whose mother was Jewish. Um, I, I don't know that macho man ever really spoke about his religion. I certainly never heard him talk about it Jewishly. I did meet his brother who played the genius, if anyone watched wrestling in the 80s and 90s, Lenny Palfo, Leaping Lenny Palfo. Um, so... Uh, Lenny is not, does not consider, I don't think he considers him Jew, so Jewish, but he will say his mother's Jewish. He's very proud of that. Um, you know, I think he's sort of like a born again. Also, uh, Mark Miro, who was a wrestler for a while, um, also born again Christian, grew up in a Jewish home. So, um, you know, Goldberg, and obviously Goldberg is, uh, was very popular in the late 90s, and then a little bit today um, is it, it fun. And then I like, I watch all sorts of wrestling. So I, I sort of have a long running list um, of guys who I really, uh, really um, love watching when there's Jewish wrestlers. I have a, uh, a Jewish uh, figure, just a uh, Jewish wrestling figure collection, which my daughters love to play with. It's like, they call it like daddy's Barbies. So, <laughs> so that's nice. Um, you know, I think that, uh, wrestling's a sport we can uh, um, wrestling's a sport sort of we can we can get behind uh, and combat sports too because Jews are fighters I mean there's just there's something also romantic about baseball which which I think we all love um, and I, I compare that very much to being sort of like a Jew right it's the smells it's the taste it's the tradition it's the history it's sitting next to your family during a long drawn out service slash game, right? There's something um, romantic about that, um, which is gonna be very tough for a lot of people this year, I, I'm, I'm included. Um, uh, so my original proposal to my synagogue, which was shot down, was that we rent out the minor league baseball stadium. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was not unanimously shot down. I thought we actually were gonna get it passed. Uh, and we had fully until this week to do this. We had a contract signed and uh, mm -hmm. um, open air and we figured not everyone's going to come. It's an 8,000 person stadium with, you know, let's say we get 300, that's 300 more people that celebrated to together. Um, I have a question here on the side. Bill Apter is a good friend of mine. I've emailed with him. I, the interview has never really gone through. Uh, uh, he, he's he's uh, got a great, it's great stories. Um, when you do inter your interviews, how do you determine the first question? Well, so almost all of my first questions that are written are tell my audience about you, because I might know. Um, and then I usually sort of follow, uh, I, I tr when they're written, I, I try to get them to just answer questions that sort of bring, me, bring us through a timeline. When I'm um, seated with them, and in, 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 let's say it's a, a, in person, I, I do a lot of research, so every every um, individual will be different. Um, I've become sort of a, a, a moderator and an interviewer um, through my podcast. It's called The Religion of Human Nature. You can find it on iTunes if anyone's interested. It's not sports related. It's my belief that religion isn't gone. Religion has morphed its way into uh, human nature and regular society, and I, I talk a lot about that with moderate, you know, D-list celebrities. Um, and then, um, and then I also do a bunch in person. So we've been able to really build up our fundraiser here. Um, and I've interviewed Mel Brooks and uh, Mayim Bialik. And this, in a couple of weeks, we have BJ Novak and Rain Wilson from The Office. So on that note, like I would say one of the most fascinating people I've ever interviewed about baseball 
a little bit about baseball was Aaron Sorkin, who wrote the screenplay for Moneyball, which was really, really interesting. He, he said to me, I was wearing, a, I always dress up a little bit for the fundraiser to some match the theme. So for him, I bought an A's Keepa. I'm not an A's fan, but I, I keep it in my Talos bag. It's my uh, backup. And, um, and A's socks, and I had a yellow, um, a yellow tie. So he said, you know, um, he, goes, he says to me, Aaron Sorkin, by the way, wrote um, A Few Good Men. He wrote West Wing. Uh, he's literally a writing genius. Um, and you can tell from the second you meet him, he's just in another world. Like he just sees these things very differently. And he said to me, he goes, oh, A's, I did Moneyball. I go, yeah, that's why I bought it. I'm not an A's fan in Minnesota from Chicago. <laughs> so that was funny. He, yeah. By the way, he's a huge introvert and was very nervous. But the second you meet him, he was couldn't have been nicer of a human being. Um, and really one of, maybe my, besides Mel Brooks, which to be made fun of on stage by Mel Brooks for 20 minutes, you know, don't tell my wife, it might've been the best night of my life. Um, this, uh, this is like, a, this was a second, Aaron Sorkin was just awesome to, to sort of sit down and have a chat with. Um, actually tomorrow I'm interviewing uh, Jamil Hill, who wrote, not Jewish, but she wrote a, an article uh, um, about some of the anti-Semitic comments that came out a few weeks ago for Deshaun Jackson. And, so we're talking about that and, and next week or Thursday or next, it's either next Thursday or this, or this Thursday, I'm interviewing Rachel Luba. Uh, I have a passion for women in sports because my sister was a really, really good basketball player and I have all daughters <laughs> and I take them to probably too many games. Uh, so they, um, she is a, a Trevor Bowers agent um, and she is making a really big name for herself in the sports world. I, I encourage people to listen to that. It will be, she is, incredible and uh, just a really unique person. And um, yeah, uh, what other questions? I do have one thing I want to throw by men's club at some point. Okay. Why don't you throw it by the men's club? Let okay. him throw it by the men's club. All right. So, Let's so, do the uh, men's club. so I, you know, I, I, so long story short, I, um, yeah, I'll, I'll happily talk about the Israeli team too, and I'm still working with them. So I'll happily talk about, um, so I, I had this idea a few years ago. Um, I think I pitched it to to to, uh, to Chuck Simon and then to to, to Andy Sugarman. Who, um, uh, for those of you who I'm assuming most of you know who those people are, correct? Okay. Yes. Yes, we know who yeah. we know who we know we know very okay. well. We're very good. well. You should know. This is no offense of men's club. I actually have tried very hard to keep our men's club alive in our synagogue, but the only job I ever quit in my entire life was an internship for men's club. When I got back, I got the job, came, went, went home for, for summer break or wherever I went and uh, came back and they asked me to cut my salary in half and double my hours. I said, I really appreciate the opportunity, but I think I'm going to take, I think I'm going to take a different job. <laughs> so when you're a rabbinical school, you don't really have double the amount of hours for anything. So, um, but I pitched this to both of them, which is um, a sort of, um, a, sort of a, in the vein of like some of these spring trainings, but not baseball specific, where we did sort of, we tried to get a lot of men's clubs or men's groups, maybe some prospective men's clubs, to come together for like a, a gigantic sports Shabbaton, where the whole weekend is like a Maccabi of some sorts. Not everything's basketball and baseball. There's other, there's trivia, there's other ways to get together. And each each we all buy in and each of the um, men's club groups that brings a team team. I'm, I, I don't know how many people that includes um, gets like a, a, a former or maybe every two teams shares a coach basically from a former player. And we, they have sit down talks at night and I moderate the interviews and we do like a whole big sports weekend. Um, I'm a big still believer that, um, and I, I don't know, I hope I don't ruffle feathers. I still believe that there's a place for like sports and beer in men's culture. Um, nope. You're good. <laughs> You're good. So, <laughs> so or Scott. Um, you, you got the right group here. You're you got the right group. Yeah, you hit so the group. There's you know, a place in Camp Shy. I actually, we went down the path of looking at this at, at Camp Shy in, um, in the Wisconsin Dells. 
because just of my connections to Minnesota and Chicago and Milwaukee, it made the most sense for me to do something in the hub. And then also the time lag of East Coast, West Coast, doing something centralized um, and have a home base. They have also like, they have indoor facilities. I don't know if any, I'm assuming some of you, if you're from the Midwest, have been to Camp Shy, but they have this gorgeous indoor basketball court and we could use it for other things. So uh, I'm throwing that out there because if it's still something people are passionate about, I would happily get on board and try to figure this out. I mean, it might obviously be not going to happen this year, but um, in the future, if that's something. I gotta, uh, yeah, go ahead. Neither rabbi pitched it to us. Huh? Neither rabbi talked to me about it. I was the president at the time. Neither rabbi talked to you about it? Neither rabbi talked to me about it. Oh, well, maybe because well, you were in the Cub shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Rabbi. Um, there could have been a Kiddush Club shirt. It wouldn't matter. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. yeah. Rabbi, we, we, uh, you have the right group here. You're actually, the person speaking right now is in charge of the convention for FJMC, which is next year in Chicago. Um, at the end, uh, you have all the big, big machers of FJMC live. And I think you have a very interesting idea. It's something that perhaps we can talk offline and see what we can do with that. Cause I think most everyone on this call for sure. And many, many others would, would, Love sports, love scotch, love beer, and love the whole idea. So, yeah. so, so you know, thank it's you. Fun. For of course. Yeah, Danny, it's funny because over the years, um, um, yeah, the, 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 you know, so, you know, for, for a long time, uh, you know, I kept hearing the men's club, like, let's try this and let's try that from, from either national or whatever, from other rabbis, from other, and I, and I was like, maybe it's just my synagogue. But like if I, we did a, a, a manly men night basically where it was a guy's guy's night and we did, uh, we had a poker tournament going on. We had a guy, uh, a beard guy that came and shaved trim beards. Um, we, everyone got a cigar. We had scotch taste at a scotch table. Uh, we had a guy, um, we, we happened to have a family that owns a, a men's clothing store, like an old school with like a tailor. We had a tailor come in and fit everyone. And we had, I mean, we had 20 year old guys and 60 year old guys. And I was like, clearly this is what people want. I mean, the age range, we couldn't, we can't get that for anything else. And I mean, people who would have never cross pollinated in our synagogue, father, sons, uh, and it uh, we just stood back and we're like, amazing. and all these people, by the way, they all come to, a lot of these people love the wrestling. I mean, um, a lot of that space, um, you know, and by the way, we don't serve booze at our, at our wrestling. I just want people to know it's a very, fa I, I mean this seriously, we make it very clear to the kids that this is fake and we are very fan friendly. Like the, the wrestlers, you know, talk to the kids and they, we have like a guy dressed up as the thund super thunder frog and all sorts of stuff. So it's not like just WWE destroying. I like the Hanukkah havoc. I threw out presents. We did mitzvah mayhem was the other one. Um, so yeah. Do you want me to get to some of these questions in the chat, Danny? Sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes. 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 Do. Yes, okay. So one was uh, my thoughts on team Israel and where it's headed. Um, team Israel baseball has, has, is, is headed in the right direction. Um, mainly because it quickly brought responsibility or, or visibility to the game. And that got interest of the, of the country. And um, there are obstacles, though. First of all, Europe is trying to block any – the change to change the rules, basically, because Israel did well, both for softball and for um, baseball, um, of Americans playing. Not necessarily for the WBC, because that would hurt the MLB but for the Olympics. Uh, it, won't ha it won't be blocked for this coming Olympics, but they're, they're, so they're, just so you know, the women's softball team was one run away and lost in the last inning by one run. So they so are they doing that because of anti-Israel sentiment or because that's because they don't know. I think that's TBD. Uh, obviously our, our, our uh, I'm starting to help team Israel softball a little bit and our, our antennas are up to see what's behind that. You know, it could just be that they lost, <laughs> right? Which is fair too. You know, everyone's looking for an edge. So if that rule comes into play, Israel will be in a better place than it was 10 years ago in baseball, but it won't be the same. And the Jewish pride won't be there as much because some of these guys who go over at the end, like Kevin Pillar is already committed to playing in the WBC at the draft. He announced that live. It was really cool. Um, so then, by the way, that's on my YouTube page. Anyone can watch it. It's long. 
but it's kind of cool. Alan Dershowitz pops in, uh, Kevin Pillar pops in, Sean Green pops in. I mean, it's, it, it was a, it was a fun time. So, um, the, um, yeah, so, so it's headed in the right direction. Um, and I think more of these guys will play. Kit, Ian Kinsler's planning on playing in the Olympics. Ken Pilar's in, in the next WBC. And his, their biggest issue is always going to be pitching because uh, we just don't have – I mean, that Max Fried is, uh, is the pitcher who, and Josh Wolf. Um, I'm doing something with USY with him in a few weeks. Max Fried and Josh Wolf are really our hopes um, to potentially, you know, win – I mean, with, if Josh Wolf turns out to be who he was, who was drafted by the Mets in the second round, and, and Max Fried continues to be as good as he is, and you had two frontline pitchers going into the next W or two WBCs for now, I mean, yeah, you're going to compete, as, you, as anyone knows, with two great pitchers at the top of it. So, and the game of baseball is picking up in Israel. It just takes time. Um, the money isn't always there. Not everyone gets it. It's a total re-education. It's been a lot of fun to be a part of, and it's something I'm very excited personally proud of and uh yeah have i interviewed steve stone i have not um funny story so steve stone i actually got to be one of my 30 clients he was one of the bigger names i have steve stone's cell phone number i do not have steve stone's email ironically um i have talked to steve stone i have not interviewed him i have met him he assigned a baseball for me and uh but i've not interviewed him good guy I love him as a TV analysis. I'm obviously biased because he works for the White Sox. Um, and he was a very good pitcher. You know, he's probably, you know, second, third greatest Jewish pitcher of all time. Um, obviously, number one was Jose Batista for the White Sox. No, Sandy Koufax, obviously. <laughs> I've never interviewed Sandy. His, I did work out a thing where his agent, this was a big mistake I made. His agent said he would sign one item for me. I, I, I worked this whole angle and da, da, da. and uh, I have a picture of Dolph Shays signed for me and I have a picture that Sid Luckman signed for me. So I wanted the three, you know, the three, on the, you know, three of the four on the Mount Rushmore to have a picture signed for me. And um, I'm really regretting not getting a ball by Sandy because he didn't personalize it. <laughs> so it just says Sandy Kovacs. It's a great picture. It hangs in my Jewish sports hall of fame, but it's uh, I should have got the ball. <laughs> uh, let's see. Donnie, are you the only woman here again? I can't answer that for you, uh, but it's possible. Um, can you hear me, Jeremy? Can you hear me? Yes, whoever's talking, I can't hear you. You can't hear me? No. I didn't okay. expect you to read that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> no well, problem. You put, it in the about it. you put it in the chat. Uh, my opinion of Ron Bloomberg is that he's great. Great guy, Mensch, was a very good ball player. He busted his knees. I mean, he could have been a really good ball player, but, you know, he really hurt his knees. I mean, that, that's that's true. Um, have I ever spoken with Chaim Bloom? No, I've not tried to reach out. Um, he will. He's on my list. To be honest with you, I'm back. I only do one story a week uh, because of COVID-19. I've been able to arrange a lot of different things, and a lot of different Jewish organizations have asked me to help. So I haven't really had the time. Uh, I'm, I'm backed up with stories through September and I've had to postpone certain interviews because I just, I don't want to post more than one story a week. It, it becomes too much of a commitment for me. Um, I, I don't have any sport connection to the Jewish sports hall of fame on Long Island. I don't. Um, yes, I have the book, uh, uh, that Ron wrote or his, his biography. Yeah. It's a great, it's a good read. He's, he's a great guy. I never read, met Red Auerbach. I think he died before I was into this. Um, by the way, like this was never a passion for me growing up. I was a high school basketball player who, who almost played in college but chose to go to the University of Illinois. We were the second best in the country. I tried out. Um, even talked to Bill Self, who told me him. Um, uh, you know, Bill Self said to me, I don't know anything about Calvin Griffith, um, who said to me, you know, we're not taking any more guys. We, we were number two in the country and uh, sort of just played intramural. But always, my, my story is that I always had to choose between Ju Judaism and sports, always. And even though if you would have asked me at a kid what I would choose, I would have always said sports. The truth is, as I looked back at my life and as I was pacing around my college dorm room, realizing I wanted to be a rabbi, 
Um, I always, always chose Judaism. And that's when it clicked that I've been making this decision. Uh, it, it happened several times. I mean, I, I, was, supposed to, I was supposed to go to a different um, public school. I was supposed to go to, um, but I chose to learn about God instead of play baseball. Baseball was always my sport. Basketball became my sport because Ida Crown Jewish Academy did not have. Uh, uh, I know Sean Green. I don't know if he has, he wouldn't be surprised that I have him on my route rush more, but I, uh, you can tell him. <laughs> um, he's a really, he's a huge mensch. Um, uh, I've met Tal, Mark uh, Cantor, I've met Tal Brody a few times. I've interviewed Tal. Um, I went to the movie. He's also a nice, you know, a nice Israeli guy. Uh, I've done amazing work for Israeli sports and Israel and just as an ambassador. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's sort of my, like, this was never a plan to write about Jewish sports. It was never a plan to be a pulpit rabbi and things just take you in the way. Uh, and the reason I'm a pulpit rabbi is because um, I always wanted to go into education. I wanted to be a head of a day school. And um, uh, I got a, um, I had a small pulpit in Amsterdam, New York. Hmm. Not as fun as Amsterdam, Amsterdam, but uh, Amsterdam, Holland. But, but, but it, um, and I just had the most amazing experience that, and actually was supposed to do there for year two. But Mark Klee sucked me in, and I had to go work for Bethel in New Rochelle, which was a great year, and then moved out here to Minnesota uh, to be back in the Midwest, which is where my family's from. So um, we, um, you know, I just fell in love with this small pulpit and realized that's sort of what I wanted to do. To be honest with you, and um, I love my pulpit work, I've had some very interesting offers. Uh, I was recently called to potentially be a general manager of a minor league baseball team. And again, it wasn't by Mark Lee, <laughs> but, um, but, but uh, I considered it. Um, you know, I don't know what, I don't think any of us sort of know what, where life takes them and it's always important. We have a, I'll tell you a quick story. It's not sports related, but about a congregant. So um, uh, one of my congregants happens to be one of the largest um, <laughs> suppliers, supplier of hamburger buns for Mc, a little place called McDonald's. In fact, if you were to buy a hamburger bun um, in South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and parts of Canada, it would be a, it would have a hexer on it, a full out orthodox, not even me, hexer. It is mamash kosher. And uh, the reason they are the suppliers for hamburger buns for McDonald's is because a man known by the na small name of Ray Kroc came to Minnesota looking for someone to produce. For those of you who don't know, if you ever saw the founder after Chicago, Minnesota is the next place in which McDonald's begins to blossom. So they were, they came here early. So no one had heard of Ray Kroc and no other bread baker in the in, 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 area. <laughs> um, uh, you, and none of the, um, in the area, sorry, uh, would take the meeting. And this man said, I'll take a meeting. You always take a meeting. He took the meeting. And in that, he has a still to this day, a handshake deal with Ray Kroc, supplies all those hamburger buns. And um, I learned very quickly in my rabbinate, you always take the meeting because you just don't know what will happen. Maybe one day a major league team will call me <laughs> and Chaim and I can have lunch together. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, Mark, the pay was less than my rabbinic salary. That is true. It wasn't, if I was right out of school or even just graduating rabbinical school, I would have considered it. Uh, but, but yeah, now it would, it would be. We amazing. never paid much and that it's <laughs> never changed. This was a, uh, it wasn't officially minor. It was independent ball. So they, they can do certain things differently. Well, no, they, they actually have less wherewithal than we did in the minors because they were paying their players too. We didn't have to pay the players. That was done by the major league affiliates. So they even had it tougher. Um, well, I mean, I, maybe. But, uh, the, the, uh, but they were offering wasn't – it was respectable. It just wasn't – it, was, it would have been a family mistake. So, so Rabbi, um, yeah. I have a question I think that sure. would interest this group. Um, so one of our struggles at, at FJMC and in many of our clubs is attracting younger guys. 
If yeah. you look around the room right now. <laughs> um, well, Donald thinking, Miller is at least 27. I don't know. Okay. So besides Don <laughs> and, and Stan. Um, and Dave. And Dave, well, David, David, now David's actually half dead. <laughs> so I wouldn't Love count him. We all are. I wouldn't count Dave. But um, if, if I were um, my son, who's 30, who works for the Red Sox, um, I would be very attracted to someone like you on the pulpit. Um, so what has been your experience with um, your temple in Minneapolis, which I visited when I was in U.S. Wire Wheels? many, many, many years ago. So I know it's a big synagogue and I would think someone with you and your passion, uh, how, how's that been going? Have you been in, able to attract young guys or what do you do to keep nurture yeah. that? So here, here, here's, uh, let's talk about, um, I, 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 let's talk about the synagogue growth and then we can reflect on that with young families and young, and young men. Um, our synagogue has declined in membership and, um, total recharge um, of uh, participation. To give you an example, when I got here, we were close to 900, we're probably down to 775. There's just no way I can maintain the death rate. By the way, we're in St. Paul, not Minneapolis. I have congregants who, um, so, so we'll get into that in a, in a moment. Um, so if anything, we should be down to 500, but we've been able to maintain. We also historically, for those of you who don't know Temple of Aaron, you can just Google any time before I got here and you can see the turmoil that happened here. So really, really inappropriate sort of clergy behavior on multiple fronts. Um, I came in as the assistant rabbi and within a year was promoted. It was a whole thing within the RA. I, I wasn't labeled the senior rabbi for a while. I played, I, no pun intended, played ball. I think their rules are correct. I don't think you should be putting young rabbis in thousand family shoals and ask him to run with it. I've worked with all sorts of boards. Um, no, you're not, no one's ready for it. They're just not. I was the fortunate, very, very lucky to do two things. Within two years, I already saw two senior rabbis. Mark Lee's uh, rabbi, Rabbi Mel Cerner, and I saw the senior rabbi above me. So I was able to learn from two very quickly, which most are not, because if you just come right out of school, either you don't have someone in front of you or you, or you um, learn from one. Number two is um, I um, have sort of a natural business background or theory, which has helped very much. But the most important thing is that my president was also the head of HR at Target, not Target the store, Target headquarters. And she is my mentor. There is nothing this person cannot work through. So her and I, she is, she is my work, uh, she's just amazing. I can't, I can't. So to have her guide me through all the little things that would have been a stumbling block for almost anyone else uh, is, is very, for, I was the right person at the right time with the right energy. So to give you an example of our growth, when I got here, 25 people on Shul and Shabbat. My mother came to show the first Shabbat because I came in, I think I came out on a Friday or something. My wife was uh, eight months pregnant. So she, she actually flew because the drive six hours from, we had to pick up stuff in Chicago. She had to, or seven months pregnant. Um, her and a bunch of pregnant ladies used to sit in the back of Bethel together. And then, <laughs> so, so um, they, they, um, uh, that was a, a, uh, so we got here. My mother looked at me and she said, you will not last six months here. And I said, mom, give me some time. <laughs> it's my first Shabbos, give me some time, okay? Coming from Bethel, where there were 200 people at Shul every Shabbos at least, that was and no kiddish. There were stale Pesach cookies out. That was it. Um, the service was drawn out. We had an old choir um, that was just abys respectfully abysmal. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful people. And in their prime, I'm sure, great. Um, the cantor was singing an old show tune. It just did not speak to anything my generation's interested in. If we flash fo fast forward now, we get anywhere between 125 to 150 people at Shalom Shabbos, uh, which is, I'm sure, a growth that most of your synagogues would love, uh, extra 100 people. Um, and it took a lot of hard work and a lot of change. Um, my synagogue followed me. They knew that if they didn't, they would die. I think most of I don't know any of your synagogues besides Mark's. I think most of you don't know that. 
If your synagogues are declining, it's not trying to get young people to do your old, your old traditions. It's about finding a way to improve those traditions and making them relevant. I'm also one of the most traditional rabbis in the country. We are one of the most liberal synagogues in the country. So, you know, I stand toe to toe with Rabbi Shuk at Bethel and New Rochelle as one of the, a handful of people still refusing to Zoom on Shabbat. Okay, so just that's an experience that I don't think that's the answer for our movement. And I, I, I don't know, I will give in probably before David, but I have been taking a lot of heat for that. Um, so so, so the, 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 it's not just sheer numbers. It's about how do you improve the things and excite the things. Your th sometimes your rabbi is your thought leader. Not always. And that's why I sort of made that, I, I speak a lot, I'm an extrovert. But the, 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 um, the comment about Minion is that I've looked at other shoals and the first question they say to me is, okay, we have Monday morning minion, da, 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 da. And I said, well, if your rabbi is at 6.30 morning minion, when is he supposed to meet with people? If your rabbi is at 6.30 morning minion and having uh, uh, board meetings till 9 p.m. at night, when does he or she see her, their family? When does he or she meet with people to create relationships and organize with new organizations or um, take care of their health and all sorts of things? It's just it does not match. The programs need to be there. So, uh, and then a lot of it is energy. So the growth of our Shabbat morning allowed for young families to see us as a new viable option. Then we started investing in those young families. I've taken three young families to an almost fully sponsored Israel group, um, to, to Israel three times. Um, and we've only taken one full synagogue trip since then. So does that bother some of our older members? Yes. But in the long run, these members all come to Shul and they're all now solidified to the synagogue forever. So you have to really weigh your process. And listen, I, I, I throw this out to any of you who are in a conservative synagogue. And this is not to step on the toes of any of your rabbis. But all of you can email me. I, I, this is a really bad time because I'm rewriting High Holidays for the first time in my life, as all of your rabbis are. But I do my best to make time for any synagogue in the country that I can because I believe deeply in our movement. I also think the greatest thing that ever happened to the rabbis was the professionalization of the rabbinate. Um, would I, be, um, I also think it's the worst thing because we threaten our rabbis with our, their jobs. And I would tell you the biggest problem in the conservative movement is our leadership. And part of that is because your rabbis, whether they tell you this or not, are petrified for their job. And the reason we've been successful is because not for a day did I believe that this is the only place I have to be. A lot of your rabbis, especially if they've already moved once, and I don't mean inside the, inside the same city, but I mean like across the country, they're scared. They'll never admit it to you. They are scared. Because no one, none of you, want to pick up your family at 47 or 52 and move your family across the country. You don't. And so they will say yes to everything you say. And if your rabbi is saying yes to everything you say, you should know right then and there that you, are, you're, you guys are off the track. So the men that we got involved, they actually didn't want a men's club. We have three guys who are technically the presidents of our unaffiliated men's club. I have tried every which way to get them to take leadership. They'll help occasionally recruit people to come to events. Really what happens is two to three times a year, I'll throw a men's club event. That's sad. I'm not happy about that. It has been a failure of mine. I don't have anyone who's excited about it, but they are excited about doing stuff just with guys. So I do a, a scotch razor or a beer razor that, um, so like, I'm assuming a lot of you have scotch in the sukkah, right? Right. Something along that line. Okay. So we do it at my sukkah and I call it a scotch razor. Why? Now I've take, they take all that scotch, I donate it back to the shul, and that cuts into my kiddush budget because now I don't have to ever buy scotch again. And it's become an actual thing that people just bring their own um, in a positive way. 
By the way, it's also locked in the rabbi's office. I'm not a scotch. I'll occasionally, not ever from my stash, but occasionally have congregants over, but I rarely drink. Um, uh, although I could drink all of you under the table, I rarely drink. <laughs> I did go to champagne. I think I mentioned that. Um, so, um, uh, but, but, they, but they'll show up. So we also did a, um, what, the wrestling night, we did, invited men's club to um, a, um, uh, this, is all, this was not, not advertised, whatever, just emailed out to about 30 guys who have come to other events. We had, like, you could come for a pre-drink in our library, basically, before wrestling happened. And they really loved that. It was a touch point. They saw the excitement in the building. They all bought tickets to the show. Um, so that was a cross, sort of a cross-branded program. Uh, you know, we've done, we've done other stuff. Guys like to do guy things. Um, and um, I, um, yeah. Listen, I, I have other ideas for what, how men's club could be. If we're talking very candidly, I'm not sure I want to say this in front of a room of, of men's club, but, but like, I wouldn't shy away from that kind of stuff. And, and, and you have to listen to the younger guys. And, and sometimes you have to be the follower. You don't have to be the leader. So I, you know, the wrestling event, while I would have done that in a heartbeat, I knew I, I didn't have any synagogue capital to do that because Listen, I put together kosher festivals that bring in hundreds of people. We've brought in these big fundraisers. We do all these kind of crazy events, and we were trying to do them now, and they've re- – so I'll give you an example. Nod your head or raise your hand if you did your Purim, your adult Purim in the synagogue this year. Right, I'm assuming almost all of your synagogues had adult Purim. Whatever you did for your adult Purim is in the synagogue. So Purim doesn't have to be in the synagogue. It's the one time in which you don't have to break halacha to go, because remember, I'm a traditionalist. So I would never say, let's have Shabbat, like the ho- COVID is different, but non-COVID times. I would never say, let's do a high holiday service at CHS Field because I wouldn't go. So um, we did ours at the House of Comedy this year. We, rent, we, we worked out a deal with them. We didn't pay them a cent. <coughs> we read Megillah on their stage, and then we had comedians do it the whole night. It was amazing. People who never come to Purim in the last 30 years told me it was one of the best programs they've ever been to. Um, the comedian was perfectly filthy, and uh, I had a few jokes that landed, <laughs> which I was pretty proud of. Stand-up comedy is like the hardest thing in the world. And um, we did a and a and we did the best we could with kosher for the menu, and um, yeah, we've, we, we come up with really interesting branding ways to bring in new people. So it's really about a creative niche. And then, and you got to find out who has that. And it's not about who thinks they have that, but you'll see who's running a program that people are coming to. How do you, who's, who are the social connectors? Um, so, so with the young men, I think that's true too. Um, they don't want programs geared towards, um, older congregants, and they don't want a room full of older congregants. They want to see them, just like you want to see yourself there, they want to see themselves themselves there. So would you, um, so Danny, I would say to you, you know, find that one or two who speak to you, and, and they have to be social connectors. They, they probably should be the people sort of in your synagogue who are, who are excited about it, who you know can bring 10 people. Um, like if, uh, uh, like, um, I, I, you know, I, 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 if you gave me your synagogues, maybe I would know who's there. I happen to know a lot of Jewish geography, but that, that's, that's a, a, that's a way of, I mean, I could tell Mark who his synagogue should, you know, get to do these things. And you have to tell them, listen, we are re-envisioning this. And the best thing my synagogue, and the reason they got me to come out to St. Paul, because as you can imagine, like St. Paul was on our, was on our short list, but like we had some bigger cities ask us, to come to their synagogue, my wife and I. But what they said to me was, we want to give you a blank canvas and all the paintbrushes you need, and we want you to paint your masterpiece. And I said, that's awesome. How can I turn that down? Right? They weren't offering the most money. They certainly didn't have the best best city. Um, I don't believe they were the biggest synagogue. They might have been the biggest synagogue. I I had a senior ahead of me, and... um, 
I, and I loved my senior, by the way. I didn't want him to leave. I never thought I'd be the senior rabbi here. The, the plan has never been to stay in St. Paul this long. Um, but when they give you a, when they let you have paint your own mural, that's enticing for young rabbis, as, you know, especially for me as someone sort of very grounded. I believe very deeply in the conservative movement, hardcore. I believe in it. I also believe we, we've we made a lot of really bad mistakes. I'm a Jack Wertheimer guy. <laughs> that yeah. gives me any sort of insight. Like Jack and I see this very similarly. He just happens to be a scholar and able to write about it. <laughs> so that's great. So Rabbi, thank you so much for, I know we started off half an hour late, but it, this was very entertaining. I wrote you an email already that we'll, I'll follow circle back with you on Friday. And um, <clears throat> we'll talk about lots of possibilities. You're probably familiar with my temple because uh, my uh, one of our members is uh, Robert Kraft. Um, <laughs> yeah. Jonathan Kraft, oh, who happens okay. to uh, come to shul when we had shul every Saturday morning. So you'd be very impressed with that. Um, as well as uh, Sheldon Adelson also is a member. So um, uh, we'll, we'll chat. Anyway. Uh, I put so my email, by the way, for anyone who wants it. Um, you can check out my stuff online and then, uh, really, I mean, I, I'm happy. Oh, to that's help great. Talk with all of you. Okay. So David Kravitz put this all together. Yeshikawach to David. Thank you. He, he hates everybody, but. <laughs> Stand a, it's an inside joke. But he still loves everybody. So it's okay. I do. He does. This is great. So, I just want to thank the rabbi very much for uh, coming on. And it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I'm a gigantic sports fan. So for me to listen to the rabbi and also to be inspired by him speaking was made my whole day. So it was absolutely great. Um, uh, thank you all. And uh, the only other person I want to, can I see if I know someone here? I'm a big Jewish geography guy. The, this Marty, you look familiar. Marty, do I know you? You're on mute. All right. So I'm not, I don't see any connection that I know of right now. Are you, where are you from? Originally Pittsburgh, but for the last 30 years in Connecticut. Oh, all right. And and uh, I think that's it. No, no one else looks too familiar unless there's people I am just missing. So um, I really appreciate everyone's time. And again, I, I, I'm always happy to help. And it, it's it really appreciate the ask. Uh, yeah, do, do keep doing great work. And let's get through this virus and get to do great stuff together, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Take care. Appreciate it. And we'll see everyone right. next Wednesday with Brad next Asmus. Wednesday. Don't forget. Yep. Don't forget next Wednesday. Brad Asmus. Be there. Be there. Yes, Thank you. Thank so, Danny, you. on some Jewish yeah. geography, do you know Sandy or Jeffrey Rems? Yes. My brothers. Oh, this. oh really? Yeah, well, let's just, uh, Jew, Jews know Jews. I know yeah. almost everybody. Marty Melnick, I know you. Oh, my God. I know, <laughs> I know Marty, too. Hi, Marty. Hi, buddy. Yeah, Marty, USCJ. Marty with, with, with the beautiful daughter, right? Uh. Marty, <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you, Danny. Danny. Yes, everyone. Yes, sir. Give me a call tomorrow. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you, guys. We'll see you next right. week. Bye. And for those of you who are fasting, have a good fast. Yes. Thank you for being on the call, everybody. Thank you, Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Today's Tuesday, right, Danny? Yeah. I don't know what it is. Isn't it? So, so Tisha B'Av's Thursday, not tomorrow. That's tomorrow night, buddy. Tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. Well, I understand. Two, two Wednesday night and Thursday. Right. You, you well, need that, to start, but you need to start early. I did yeah, that just maybe, for you. It may be something maybe different in St. Louis. <laughs> well, considering the sun's not set yet here. And I, and I, I really – I'm really, yeah, right there. Yeah, and right. Creighton, I really hate you anyway. And we hate so you all. All right. Good, good night, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Good night. Uh